Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Hello, welcome to the latest Brandwatch webinar. And I'm really excited today because we have a distinguished guest from Forrester. We have a VP and Principal Analyst, Nate Elliott, joining us. Hello, Nate. Hi there, thanks for having me today. So guys, what we want to do today is we want to explore what we believe is you know, a pressing issue for the marketing community. Um, what Nate is going to do is dive into some of his research to talk to us uh, how Forrester has found some of the challenges around uh, social media marketing and how that is or isn't paying off at the moment, and also looking at uh, suites and point solutions and, and kind of teasing apart some of the current challenges in the marketing technology landscape. And then having set that challenge, my job I'm Will McInnes, the CMO of Brandwatch, is to respond to that and to what I would like to do is show how we're thinking about the path forwards and practically give examples of, of, a, of a tangible approach that we're seeing some of our clients use to answer some of the questions that have been posed in the first half of the webinar. So Nate's aiming to talk for about 20 minutes and I'll aim to do the same. And that should give us plenty of time for Q&A before getting you back to your busy lives. As always, with this kind of thing, we'd love to hear from you. We always finish with questions, so please tweet at Brandwatch. Use the hashtag BrandwatchTips, and there's also the chat box functionality in the webinar program. This is the running order, so I will shortly hand over to Nate and he will talk to us uh, about the challenges in social marketing at the moment, and then looking at point solutions versus social suites, and then I will pick it up from there. So Nate, over to you. Great, thank you very much. And uh, again, it's really good to have a chance to be here today. Um, I, I wanna spend my time today uh, going through some of our research on the various challenges that social marketers are expressing to us. You know, in our role at Forrester, um, we're lucky in that we get to talk to hundreds and hundreds of marketers every year. We get to survey many hundreds or thousands more every year. Um, we get a lot of information on what's working for marketers and what's not working for marketers. And in particular, I spend a lot of my time focusing on, uh, on social media marketing. And so as you can see on the next slide, um, I want to cover just a couple of, uh, of big points today. Um, first of all, I want to talk about the challenges of social media overall because the reality is even more than a decade into the era of social, even with all the potential that social has to offer us as marketers, there are still a number of challenges that we have to overcome uh, if we're going to be successful with this channel. And I want to spend the second part of my presentation uh, focusing uh, in particular on, um, on the question of social technology platforms. And, and one of the things we're hearing more and more about from marketers is that the challenge of understanding the value of social point solutions versus the promise of social suites. Uh, but we'll get to that in a second. I, I want to start with this question of the challenges of social media. And, and as you can see on the next slide, um, it stands to reason that there would be some challenges in social media. The reality is so many marketers are using social in so many different ways. Um, it remains odd to me that uh, this far into the era of social marketing, we still think of social media as one thing. The reality, of course, as all of you know, is that social is a lot of different things, that there are many different strategies and tactics we can use, and that these strategies and tactics play themselves out on a number of different social sites, the ones that we own, ones that independent third party owns, and of course, um, businesses that are running social networks as well. Earlier this year, we had a chance to survey about 200 avid social marketers. And I'll make a point right off the bat. We're not looking right now at data from your common run-of-the-mill social marketer. Um, what we did was find a sample of nearly 200 of the most energetic, the most active social marketers we could find because we wanted to dig into their experience on using social media. And, and so what we found when we asked these 100 84 avid social marketers, which of the following social tactics do you use, was that every single one of those 184 maintained a Facebook page. 97% had Twitter accounts. More than 80% were paying for ads on Facebook, and more than 60% were paying for ads on Twitter. You see influencer marketing. You see branded blogs and branded communities. There are so many different social tactics, and marketers are using more and more of those social tactics. And when you add all that up, as you can see on the next slide, that leads to quite a lot of money being spent. 
In fact, in the U.S. alone this year, marketers are going to spend almost $10 billion on social media marketing. In Western Europe, that's going to add another 3.2 billion euros worth of social marketing spend and of course there'll be billions more in Eastern Europe, in Africa and Asia and South America and elsewhere around the world. So there are a lot of marketers using social. They're spending a lot of money on social but unfortunately that's not the end of the story. As you can see on the next slide, um, despite all these marketers spending money, despite all, these, despite all these different tactics they're using, um, most marketers are still having a hard time proving to their bosses that social media is delivering the business value that those bosses are looking for. Um, this is another view of that survey I told you about of avid social marketers. And what we did was actually break out um, the satisfaction scores of the social practitioners, right? Those are the, the dark blue bars. Those are the folks who are using social media in a hands-on way. They're the ones managing those social programs every single day. Um, and then we separated their responses out from the responses of their bosses, what we call social managers. These are folks who don't necessarily have their hands on the trigger of social media. These are folks who are overseeing social programs, but who also, in many cases, are overseeing search programs and email programs and other kinds of digital marketing programs. And what we found is that, as you might imagine, the practitioners were a bit happier with social marketing than their bosses were. But what's really concerning here is the gap. I mean, when you look at the gaps that we see, Marketers, social practitioners are nearly twice as likely to see strong value in organic Facebook posting as their managers are. 52% of social practitioners gave posting organically to a Facebook page, five out of five for delivering business value. Only 28% of their bosses would agree. Uh, you can see uh, uh, another big gap at the bottom of the screen, uh, organic posting on Twitter. 39% of practitioners said that it delivered uh, outstanding business value compared to only 27% of their managers. Paid ads on Twitter, the gap is absolutely enormous. There's a big gap for paid ads on Facebook. We see it on a number of the other social channels that we track as well. The reality is this. Again, we're more than 10 years into this era of social marketing, and marketers are engaging in a huge variety of social uh, tactics, they're spending billions upon billions of dollars in social media, but yet we're still having problems. We're still not delivering the kind of business value that our bosses are looking for as social marketers. And so um, what, what I wanted to do was to figure out where the problems were, right? Because obviously there's a ton of potential here. It's not just that we have more audience in social than anywhere else in digital, it's that the, the potential to actually interact with people is phenomenal. I mean, this should be working incredibly well. So we wanted to figure out why it maybe wasn't working as well as it could, what the challenges were, and maybe how we could address some of those challenges. So what you see on the next slide uh, is actually a, a list of um, some of the challenges that marketers are reporting to us in social media. We said, you know, it, and I'll, I'll say this, what we're looking at right now is the data we collected from about 120 marketers about their posting organically to Facebook and Twitter and other social sites, right? So um, this is focusing very specifically on marketers' favorite social tactic, which is posting onto social networks. And we said, when you think about how you do this, what are your biggest challenges? Uh, and uh, we gave them a the chance to choose up to three responses. And you can see the number one response by a huge margin, 53% of the marketers we surveyed said that measuring the performance of what's happening on their Facebook profile and a Twitter account is the biggest challenge they have with organic social marketing. Further down the list, you can see that 38% say that finding or creating the content they need to publish is a challenge. 27% said that deciding what type of content to publish is a challenge as well. So I want to start today by focusing on, on those two pieces because measurement is at the top of this list and then the next two responses both have to do with well, what the heck should I be publishing? What kind of content should I be creating and putting out there um, as a social marketer? So let's flip to the next slide and, and see if we can maybe solve um, a couple of these challenges. Um, here's something I'll, I'll say. I, I've been studying social media for about 12 years now at Forrester Research, and I've run surveys like the one I just showed you to all different kinds of marketers in all different kinds of geographies in Europe and Asia and North America, and I've been doing it for more than a decade now. And every single time I've run a survey like that, measurement has been the number one problem or the number one challenge um, reported by social marketers. Um, this is a problem in 2003, and it's still a problem today in 2015. It seems remarkable that 12 years uh, after I started asking these questions, we still wouldn't have found an answer. We still wouldn't have figured out how we should be measuring social. But here's the thing. 
we're kind of doing this to ourselves as marketers because it really is not helpful that we are so willing to accept nearly any metric as evidence of social success. If you flip to the next slide, what you can see is, you know, at Forrester we run these things every year called the Forrester Groundswell Awards. We put out a request and we say to people, um, we want to see your social programs from the last year so that we can recognize the very best social programs on earth, right? We want to see the best stuff from anywhere in the world so that Forrester can hold it up and say, these guys are the best social marketers we could find. This is the kind of social program that everyone else should be emulating. And last year, 84, sorry, 83 companies um, submitted entries to the Forrester Groundswell Awards. This is a partial list of the different kinds of metrics that those 83 different entries cited. And here's the thing, I know it looks like a really long list, and it is, there's I think 14 different items on this list. But look at the last one, the word other gets a score of 58%. That's because there are, and I'm not exaggerating, there are more than 40 different individual metrics stuffed into that other category. None of those individual metrics scored higher than 5% in, in our analysis, but yet, 40 different metrics had between 1% and 5% of marketers using them. Overall, 57 different metrics for 83 different programs. That's incredible to me. That means that every other marketer, literally every second marketer in our survey, or, or in the Groundswell Awards rather, um, was willing to use a completely different metric than the marketers before them. Um, we, as I said, will just, we'll accept anything. Um, we're, we're very, very, um, eager to find data that proves that social is working. And the problem is this, um, when we accept literally any metric that comes our way, it creates a credibility gap. When marketers tell us that they can't measure the power of social, part of what they're saying is that social is really hard to measure because our bosses don't believe the numbers that we're giving them. Well, when you're willing to accept any number, when you're willing to hand your boss any number, that's a problem. It stands to reason that bosses are not believing of whatever random metric we put in front of them this week. And unfortunately, as you can see, even the best social marketers, even the folks who think that they created world-beating social campaigns, fall, uh, uh, um, fall afoul of this rule, right? Even, even they're uh, saying, well, well, we'll just we'll take any metric and hold it up as evidence that our social program succeeded. So um, measurement's a big problem. Our willingness to accept nearly any metric is a big problem as well. Um, and if you go to the next slide, I think there's, there's a corollary to this as well because um, there are ways to fix this. Right? Um, if you think back to that list we just showed you at the top, the list were things like comments and shares and number of followers. Engagement metrics were at the very top of this list. Even for the best marketers, not only were we measuring too many different metrics, but we're measuring too much engagement metrics. But here's the thing. Not a single marketer that I've talked to, not a single vendor or agency or social network that I've talked to has ever shown a correlation between engagement metrics and business value. For all the different companies out there encouraging us to, to measure engagement rates, we've just we've never seen any of them actually provide the data that says when you drive this many comments on your Facebook post, or when this you drive this many retweets of what's happening on on your Twitter post, um, that it correlates to an X percent increase in brand awareness, or a Y percent increase in uh, intent to purchase, uh, or a Z percent increase in actual sales. And without that correlation, it's hard to take these engagement metrics seriously. I mean, even Facebook itself, which um, was for a long time the company that was shouting from the rooftop that you should be measuring engagement, even Facebook now says that engagement is, quote, not a reliable indicator, end quote. So when we talk to smart marketers, um, we start to see a solution to this biggest problem in social marketing. We actually um, talk to marketers who are looking for the metrics that they use in other digital channels and applying them into what's happening in the social channel. Because here's the thing, those social managers who don't believe that social is working well enough, as we saw a few slides ago, they do believe that search is working well. And they do believe that email is working well, they think the brand site is working well in general. They have more faith in these other channels. And if we can show them social metrics side by side with metrics from these other channels that they have faith in, well, that's a really big deal. Um, and that's the kind of thing that's going to start to win over these VPs of marketing, these directors of digital marketing as well. So, for instance, counting the number of clicks that you're getting on your social post is actually a valuable metric. And I know, especially in the digital banner space, clicks are not our favorite metric at this point. But here's the thing. Clicks directly correlate to site traffic. And when we can get people out of a social network and onto our own website, there's at least the potential that some business value has been created. 
because people are now spending time on our site, learning about our products, figuring out our services, determining whether they want to buy from us. Likewise, we know that search and email are really good at proving out the number of leads they generate and the number of sales that they generate. And clicks are a great conduit, especially if you apply them to your web analytics tools, to figuring out what social traffic turned into leads, which social traffic turned into sales as well. So clicks and site traffic and leads and sales, these are not very social feeling metrics, but the reality is they're the metrics that our bosses believe in. And if we can get those metrics together for social, then we'll have a better chance of convincing our bosses that social is working well. Right. So, um, so that's a measurement. Um, on the next slide, we can um, start to talk about uh, one of the other challenges um, that we saw in that first slide where people said, well, I don't know what to measure. I also don't know what to post in social media. And posting the right content is really difficult. But here's the thing. There's a way of doing this, right? And if we actually stop and think about where people are in their customer life cycle when they reach a piece of content, then that can tell us the kind of content that's going to be successful. So for instance, if we're using social tactics that help people discover our brand or our product or our service for the first time, we need to offer them content that, that shows them that our product can actually start to solve their problems. So on the next slide, you can see um, one of my favorite examples of this. Um, uh, the Italian fashion brand uh, Coca, uh, and uh, if you guys can hit the next slide for me, then I think we'll see a slide of Coca. Um, oh, sorry, it's a customer life cycle model. So um, this is, you know, when we look at the customer life cycle, um, the start of most customer life cycles is people discovering, right? If they don't discover our brand or a product or a service, then, um, then uh, they can't actually buy from us. So, so what kind of content um, do we use when people are discovering? Well, we know that, that the kinds of social tactics that drive discovery are things like word of mouth and social ads. And so when we're using word of mouth and social ads, we need to remember people are first discovering our brand and our products right now. And we need to give them the kind of content that shows them our brand and our products are going to be something that might be a solution to one of their needs or one of their desires. Um, and the next slide now uh, is going to be an example from, uh, from an Italian fashion brand called Coca. Uh, now, they launched into Germany, and they didn't really have any customers in Germany, so they used word of mouth to create new awareness and new discovery. Right? Um, they reached out to three of the biggest German fashion bloggers. They got them to promote Coca on the fashion blog. And um, what they did was they actually had these bloggers show off some of the individual items that Coca was offering. So it wasn't just, hey, there's this new fashion brand. Coca knew that if it could actually show people some of, um, some of the collection, that that would make people say, wow, that actually, that looks pretty good. I, you know, this is the kind of company that maybe has a solution to one of my desires, which is good-looking clothes. At the end of the day, by offering the right kind of content, by showing off new items to these discovery channels like word of mouth, they were able to increase the number of people who came back to their German website by more than 900%. So an outstanding job by Coca of using the right kind of social content based on where people were in the customer life cycle to sort of drive them further into that customer journey. And that's the kind of thinking we need to use at the other stages of the life cycle as well. Um, if you guys go to the next slide, we can see um, we can use this thinking as well um, when people are exploring our products. Right after people discover what we have to offer, they explore in more detail. This is where they're trying to make a purchase decision. Um, and so if we can give them more detailed content about our products, if we can show them what our other customers think of our products, then that gives us a great chance to, to find those people who are exploring our products and actually convert them to become customers. On the next slide, you can see actually where that fits in the customer life cycle, right? After people discover, they explore. And really, in most cases, they're coming back to the brand's website to explore. So putting social content on the brand's site does a great job of supporting that exploration and convincing people to buy from us. On the next slide, you can see um, one of our favorite examples of this. It's from the B2B side, but there's this a company, Webroot. It's a, it's a web security vendor. And they knew that putting social content on their site would support people's exploration. So they put these video customer testimonials on their product pages. And when they did that, the number of confirmed leads that the sales team got off the website increased by 3.4x. Uh, an incredible increase in the number of leads. Again, because it was the right kind of content. It was people really talking in detail about what, what they liked about the product, what features were important to them, and why they should buy the product the perfect kind of content for that stage of the customer life cycle. Finally, on the next slide, after people are, um, have bought from you and they want to come back and engage with their company some more, um, 
you can offer them content that tells them how to get more value out of the things that they've actually bought from you. On the next slide, you can see what that means in the customer life cycle, right? So people discover the products, they explore in more detail. Hopefully they buy the products and start using them. Well, um, after people buy and use the products, maybe they have to ask us some questions. Maybe they just want to engage with us because they like our company. And things like customer communities on our own websites, but also social profiles on Facebook and Twitter, these are the kinds of things that can drive post-purchase engagement. And as you guys can see on the next slide, um, you know, there, there are lots of good examples of this. Um, uh, but if you guys hit the next slide, we'll see uh, one particularly good one, uh, which is what Barclay Card is doing with its travel community. Right? So one of the things Barclay Card uh, promotes itself for, one of the things that uh, this credit card uh, has as, as key features are a number of very travel-friendly features to the credit card. And so um, they actually want to make sure people are using the card in that way. Um, uh, if they use the card to take advantage of the travel benefits, they're going to be more likely to stay loyal to the card. So Barclay actually started this travel community for its Barclay card members. And they actually wound up getting tens of thousands of more people using their card to book travel than they had before the community existed. They were making sure that people were understanding the full value of the card that they had in their pocket and that they were getting that value. And that actually winds up increasing things like loyalty and lifetime value. Again, a great example of targeting the kind of content you're offering to where people are in the customer life cycle when they reach that specific uh, social tactic or that specific social community. So these are some of the ways that we can solve the challenges of, uh, of how to measure properly in social but also some of the ways we can solve the challenges of what kinds of content we should be posting in social. But if you hit the next slide, there's, there's another thing that was on that list of, um, uh, of challenges as well, which is finding the right partners and finding the right vendors to use in social media. The fact is there are so many technology companies out there who can help us with our social programs. And we want that help in many cases. I mean, we, we need good technologies to support what we're doing in social media. Um, in fact, if you guys hit the next slide, um, what you can see is that there are all these different ways of using social media um, to, uh, uh, sorry, using social technology to, to help your social programs. I mean, if, if you're running a good social program, hopefully you're planning in advance what's happening, but then there are these three different ways that you can actually use social. You can use social by adding it to your own website. You can engage with people on social networks like Facebook or Twitter. You can reach new audiences through, show, through social. Um, hopefully, um, you know, you're measuring and using that measurement as a feedback loop to, to do new planning. And, and here's the thing. There are all these different tools that can help us, right? So when we're planning social programs, listening platforms are a fantastic tool for understanding our audience's behaviors and preferences and needs. And they can help us plan our social program in terms of what we're going to do for the next 12 months or even just what our social community manager is going to do for the next 12 minutes. Listening platforms are important tools for doing that. If we're going to reach new audiences through social, social reach platforms like social ad buying tools and word of mouth technologies are important technologies to help us with those social reach programs. If we're going to add communities or ratings and reviews or blogs to our own websites and social depth platforms are really important. Um, and finally, if we're going to engage with people on social networks and social relationship platforms are important tools. Um, we at Forrester see these as four different kinds of social technology, and we actually do analyses and like what we call wave reports on these four different categories of social technology. Um, but here's the thing. Um, it seems really appealing um, to, uh, to work, obviously, to work with some of these vendors, and you want to make sure you're working with the best vendors possible. Um, the problem is, when you hit the next slide, um, what you see across many of these categories is that a lot of social marketers aren't particularly happy with the vendors that they're using. Again, this is uh, just about social relationship platforms, right? The companies that help you manage your Facebook page and your Twitter account and your Instagram account. But when we ran a survey last year and we asked marketers, and we did it in a blind fashion, right? So, so we, these are marketers who, um, uh, who didn't have to report to us which vendor they were using. We did that to encourage more honesty. And what we found was only 27% of the marketers we surveyed would recommend their social relationship platform to a friend or a colleague. Forty-three percent would not recommend that tool. Now we asked the question using the net promoter scale, and, and if you under, if you know the net promoter score, um, a negative sixteen is where this category netted out. That's not a very good sign, right? Net promoter scores are almost always positive unless you're doing something quite wrong. And the reality is this particular social 
technology category as a group netted out at a negative 16 net promoter score. So marketers need these vendors to help them succeed, but by and large, um, there are a lot of companies that have to work with, and they're not very happy with many of these companies. And as you can see on the next slide, that's one reason that th this notion of social suites is so appealing to marketers. I mean, th the data on that next slide is actually going to show us um, that um, when we talk to these avid social marketers again, right, when we go back to these most active of all marketers in social media, um, um, what we find is that almost 70% of them say that they want to buy social suites. 69% of this audience agreed or strongly agreed that it's more effective to buy all their social tools from one vendor as opposed to to buy them from lots of different best-in-class vendors. Um, that is overwhelming uh, approval of this notion of social suites. And, and again, I, I get it. Um, marketers are sometimes disillusioned with the vendors they have. They know that there are lots of different kinds of social technology out there. They understand that there's a lot of social data to deal with, and they like the notion that their social data will be available to all the different vendors they work with. And they think that having one vendor handle all this stuff is the right answer. But here's the thing. According to all the research we've done, that 69% of marketers who think suites are the answer, they're dead wrong. <laughs> because every other piece of data we collect about social suites says that these suites underperform under best-in-class point solutions. So if you hit the next slide, we'll actually talk through some of those reasons. Um, and, and, and here's our statement on this. Social suites offer more problems than they offer solutions. First and foremost, because even the very best social suites are going to force their client to use substandard tools. On the next slide, you can see what I mean by that. And, and here's the thing. There are social suites out there that do one or even two things very well. But there's no social suite that can do all four of the, the things you need in social. There's no social suite that can do all of those well. I mean, you can see some of the big vendors out there who compete in the social suite category. And you can see that, you know, maybe one's great as a social listening platform, but its social reach platform, its social ad buying tool is so uh, mediocre that the cl our clients in the marketplace didn't even demand that we evaluate them last time we looked at a dozen or so of the best social ad platforms out there. Or maybe a company is really good at offering that social reach platform. Maybe they do have a great ad buying tool, but their social relationship tool is so poor that it finished far behind everyone else we evaluated in our last review of social relationship platforms. The reality is no matter how good any social suite vendor is at one or even two, possibly even three of these social technology categories, there's nobody who can compete at all four. And that means if you take the social suite, you're going to wind up with one, sometimes as many as three different tools in that mix that quite simply you would never even consider buying as a standalone solution. Even the best social suites are forcing marketers to use substandard tools. But there's another problem as well, as you can see on the next slide, and it's, it's not just that the tool set isn't there, it's that this promise of integrating all these tools has never actually come true. I mean, this notion of an integrated social suite remains, unfortunately, just an empty promise. When we talk to the clients of the three companies out there who can claim all the different parts of the social suite, every single one of those vendors had clients complaining about the lack of integration that was taking place, about promises that have been made sometimes as many as three or four years ago to integrate different pieces that still today weren't yet true. And we actually believe that these social tools don't really de benefit from a deep integration anyway. I mean, it's very useful to have your social data flowing across all these different social technologies. But beyond that, there doesn't seem to be any real need to integrate these different tools. I mean, think about it from this point of view. The tool you use to manage your ads on Facebook is really just a display ad buying tool. What on earth does that have to do with the tool you use to manage your branded blog? I mean, if we take the word social off those pieces, you'd never, you'd never in a million years say, well, I have to make sure that my display ad platform is connected to my content management platform that runs the website. Just because we add the word social back in and say, oh, well, the social ads now, and it's the social part of the website, that doesn't mean that there's any greater need for integration. Beyond this notion of connecting the data between all these different tools, there just really isn't any benefit from integrating, even if the vendors could make the integrations happen which they couldn't. And that leads us to my final slide, which is what marketers actually think about 
um, uh, about uh, the social suites versus the social vendors, because because this is for me the most important thing. Marketers like social suites in theory. Again, almost 70% of the marketers we surveyed said they wanted social suites. But when you actually have a look at what they think about social suites versus what they think about point solutions, they are much less satisfied with social suites than they are with point solutions. Now, both these numbers look reasonably high, right? 92% of the clients of point solutions are satisfied with the features and functionality they have. And 64% of clients of social suites would say that the features and functionality match what they were promised. So 64% isn't a terrible number until you realize we're only looking at reference clients of these vendors. So even though these were the clients that the vendors gave us to talk to because they were the happiest and the satisfied customers they could find, still less than two-thirds would agree that what they got matched what they were promised. Again. There's just, there's just not enough value in integrating these different social tools together, and the marketers, or sorry, the vendors who are trying to do it just haven't gotten there, right? They haven't been able to buy and build all these different things and bundle them all together effectively. What we have seen is that the companies who focus on doing a couple of things well in social media, the vendors who offer best-in-class social point solutions, those are the ones who are able to offer more value. So that's some of our latest research on the challenges of social and what we think marketers should be looking at. At this point, I'm going to hand it back over to Will and uh, let Brand Watch talk about some of their thinking as well. Thank you, Nate. That was fantastic. Uh, enjoyed that. And obviously, as always with Forrester, that's based on, on lots of research and real kind of examples. So thank you for sharing those ideas. Okay. So as, 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 as I warned you, um, the, the gauntlet has been thrown down. We've got a couple of challenges to respond to. And, I, and when I say we, I'm really talking about us, the community. We're all either practitioners, vendors, uh, integrators. And here we are staring this in the face. There's work to do. And to recap, the research from Forrester shows that there are two big issues here. Firstly, ROI is, is poor for social marketing. There's a credibility gap that Nate described. We've been doing this for 10 years. We must be able to do a better job. Um, but it's really still quite disappointing at the moment. And management in particular aren't drinking the Kool-Aid. Secondly, there's this very clear evidence that suites are less satisfying than point solutions. Um, so, so these are problems that we need to address because you know, customers deserve better. You guys, if you're on a brand side or in an agency, you want solutions to these, to these two challenges. So I guess the question is, is what's next? How do we solve for that? Just a bit of language to get us going because I think we need to continually evolve our understanding of the challenges and of the landscape. When I think about what Brandwatch does and its peer set of other companies do, you know, there's other terminology that's been knocking around for a while. Like Nate said, he gave us that view of, of the kind of the legacy here. So we've been doing this for a while. And along the way, we've called it social media listening, social media monitoring, social data, social analytics. And they all kind of encompass elements or use cases or, or particular pieces of what you and we now do on our day-to-day -day jobs. But actually, when I think about a Fortune 1000 organization with a team of 20 or 15 analysts and an internal client group of 200 or 2,000 users, each of who are being streamed, tailor-made insights and reports on a daily or even more frequent basis, those, that terminology doesn't quite feel right. And also, we've launched other things recently at Brandwatch, like Brandwatch Signals, which is a really intelligent automated alerts product and that puts into the palm of your hand things you need to know but wouldn't have otherwise spotted as quickly. And you know, is that social media monitoring? Is it listening? Is it analytics? So this isn't a desire to rename things for the sake of it, but we're definitely seeing ourselves as being in the enterprise social intelligence space. And I want to kind of make sense of that in the context of what Nate has talked about, because this isn't just meaningless buzzwords. It directly speaks to the challenges that he's laid down. For me, as a marketer, if I'm getting, if I'm getting what this promises, then I'm getting 
clearer and more credible ROI. And what we believe at Brandwatch is the best way to do that, the best way to overcome the hurdle that Nate has described is by blending social with non-social data. Secondly, I actually think that we need to go beyond just trying to understand social marketing or social media marketing in isolation. The best answers, the smartest insights, the real value is probably in broader marketing and business value. Social is just one piece of the jigsaw. So enterprise social intelligence might inform you know, decisions around sponsorship of a stadium, around identifying customer experience issues in a retail environment, in identifying hotspots that would be good locations to, to base new business uh, premises. So we need to think a bit more broadly and in a bit more connected way. And then lastly, one of the things informing our approach of Brandwatch that fits into this classifier of enterprise social intelligence is you know, how do we overcome this sweets and point challenge? How do we get the best of integration and distribution and how do we how do we not compromise too much? So I really want to speak to some of that. Just on a functional basis, if you wanted to understand how we at Brandwatch see enterprise social intelligence before I move on, we think there are four main building blocks. So there's the conversation stuff. That's the keywords, the social listening or analytics that we've grown up with. Increasingly low, what we're doing here at Brandwatch is we want to offer a people-centric view into the world of social, one that thinks about audiences that starts with the humans or groups of humans and then figures out what their topics of interest are, which networks they belong to, which locales they hang out at. Thirdly, in response to lots of demand, and you probably experiencing this yourself in, in wherever you work, is that the geolocation element of all of this is really exciting and promising. Think about Foursquare, think about Yelp, Think about mobile, fi mobile phones and Wi-Fi wi in store as opportunities to really understand not, not the what or the who, but the where of what's being talked about. And then lastly, I think enterprise social intelligence needs to deliver insights into the fullness of our content footprint, insights into the fullness of our 360-degree brand, and that needs to include images and visual and perhaps video too. So let's get practical, because you didn't come to hear some sort of uh, dusty textbook on what enterprise social intelligence is, nor did you come for an advert on Brandwatch. So what I want to do is walk through some specifics. This webinar promised to talk about closing the gap and the disconnect in particular between marketing technology and business value. Nate's laid down the gauntlet, and I want to speak about how we think you can respond to that. So in, in that modern technique, we've got five steps for you to take, five ways to close the gap that I wanted to, to share with you today. What we've seen with our clients who are making the best progress here in showing real business value that's broader than just social is they're starting with who. They're starting with a really open mind about who can we deliver insights and value to in the business that we're working for or if we're an agency within the broader client group, beyond perhaps the point person who deals with our relationship. We think at this first step stage, what we've seen is the best way to approach this is asking which functions could benefit from the social intelligence that we have. So this is really about putting the enterprise into enterprise social intelligence. It's thinking more broadly than just marketing or even just digital or social marketing. Clients are really succeeding here, and they know they're succeeding because after a while, they're not asking which parts of the organization can we help. They're getting, they're fielding inbound requests, and people are saying, hey, we hear you're really good at giving smart answers from social, but that are broader than just about social media marketing. So doing that organization, there are a couple of ways to approach it. You can think about the organization itself, so you can kind of do a top-down approach, Think about the departments, think about the org organogram of, of the organization, its family tree, and work backwards from department to department into use cases. That can work well. Or you can, you can, you can work from the use cases up. 
So I just wanted to touch on a, on a couple of these and, and drill into a bit more detail. As social has become more distributed and moved from being just a marketing thing to being more like a, an enterprise-wide sensor or a, or a brain, I'm interested in the newer use cases. So yes, you can see things in sales and marketing there, and, and maybe you're familiar with some of the things in, in customer service. So I'm going to pick a couple of the more exotic use cases. Let's look at operations and distribution. These are areas where real business value is created, where real cost is incurred, where, where the big nitty-gritty, meaty functions of business often happen. One of the things we've seen here is clients using insights from social, intelligence from social, to inform demand forecasting. So looking at the pre-release buzz for titles or new products. And that's something we'll touch on in, the, in, a, in a later step. Or if you think about something like the impact on weather, on food sales, in shopping uh, supermarkets, in retail, or in travel, there are some really interesting opportunities in operations and distribution. We've also seen one of our clients monitoring the health and well-being of its supply chain, which has a huge impact on the success of its own business. So using this social intelligence to monitor their success and their performance and to look for early warnings. And lastly, one of our clients in the food and beverage industry has been using social intelligence fused with other data sources to spot up and coming locations where it should have a distribution relationship to pick out the hip new spots in town. So once you've thought more broadly about who can we help in this enterprise social intelligence world, getting broader than just social media marketing, I think there's this real opportunity, and it was something that Nate touched on, which is to go further than engagement metrics. How can we enrich social data to come up with something that's blended, something that's smarter, something that carries more weight, and that helps us make better decisions? I think it's really exciting to start to do some kind of audit or inventory of the data that's available in your organization. Take a moment to consider on the left-hand side. This is stuff you're probably more familiar with. Maybe you're already blending social with some of this stuff. There are some great opportunities here. For me, the ones I get most excited about, for whatever reason, are web analytics data, so your website um, performance and people's behavior on the website, and CRM data. To, mo to me, those are really kind of core paths through an organization. They're really important, heavily trafficked touch points. And those, along with email marketing information, which I actually accidentally left off the list, I noticed, those feel like really good places to start. But there are others that may reflect your business. On the right-hand side, though, is where the really exciting and creative stuff happens. This is where we've seen clients starting to experiment and get big steps forward in understanding the true return that their activity on social is delivering. And it's because they're no longer just looking at social. They're looking at the impact and the interwoven relationships between social and broader business behavior. So I mentioned weather, which I find really exciting. Loyalty cards, point of sale data, location. And located in that second to last bullet point, public and government data, there are some really interesting sets of information that are available in the world that if you blend them with your own proprietary data and what you can discover from social, you can derive some really interesting understandings. So what we're saying here in this second step is, you know, find it, blend it, win it. How do you, how do you get this? Ask around, ask your client or your stakeholders. Ask the IT or the IS function. Maybe you're a big enough business that you have a data team. Or who knows, you may even have a chief data officer. Speak with the marketing technologists, the people who've got the tricky job of trying to piece these separate silos together. And with agencies. Agencies are often sat on tons of interesting, smart intelligence. How can we plug those together? So asking which functions have got the valuable data that if we could get our hands on it, we could fuse in interesting ways. I think that's a really good second step. Then we need to get to the, the tricky bit. 
but it's where the value is is kind of where the rubber hits the road. So how can how how can these be blended? Where where do these pieces come together? I went to a great conference in San Francisco earlier this year, the Martech conference, and some of you will read uh, the blog that goes along with this or have seen the insane um, landscape diagrams that show just how complex and competitive the marketing technology landscape is. And here in this community, about 50% of the audience that day were in IT, and about 50% raised their hands to say they were in marketing. But what everyone agreed was that the different pieces of the jigsaw didn't play nicely enough to one, uh, together with one another. And as the SEO expert Danny Sullivan tweeted on the day, you know, what we really want here, the end goal, what success looks like is we don't want our end consumer to have to keep going around the table and reintroducing themselves. Information should be flowing between these many diagrams that were shown on the day, some messy, some neat, that illustrated how each of the particular brands presenting had, had considered the topology, the geography of their marketing technology stack. And what it left me with was realizing that even though Brandwatch is a best of breed provider, even though we're proud and loud about the fact that we're a point solution, every marketing stack, every client's environment, no matter how simple, no matter how small or big or complex, actually combines suites and point solutions. We're all operating in a blurred world. And the reason for using this visual is it's because these are all pools that need to connect. They need to be running together. So at Brandwatch, the way we've approached this is by partnering with other best of breed point solutions. So Percolate, Hootsuite, Spreadfast, Conversion, Clara Bridge, Idea Cage, and more coming. We look at what our customers auto work with and partner with those guys. And that's great but the world is still much kind of bigger and more complex than that. So I think what you need to be looking at, kind of back to you, is you know, does your partner in this game, does, your, does, does any piece of the marketing technology stack that you're operating have an API? At Brandwatch, we have a premium API which connects to custom build platforms that our clients have developed themselves. It connects to other technologies that we don't partner with on a day-to-day -day basis, but will happily connect to uh, on behalf of the client engagement. We've had clients build whole businesses around this where they're sucking some of the intelligence out of Brandwatch and then weaving additional layers on top. And we need to think about how broadly information can be distributed beyond just connectors. So beyond connecting either through integrations and APIs, where else can we help this information spread to? Command center products like Vizio from Brandwatch are, are part of that, as well as alertings. So uh, most social analytics platforms offer alerts. We now have Signals, which is an intelligent automated alerting system that advises you of the things you need to know before, before you realize. So it's figuring out where this is all going to plug into, and that's a really important piece of the jigsaw for you guys to, to work on. And then I want to finish by talking about kind of why and give a couple of examples um, that we think are really exciting about what success looks like. What success when you answer some of the challenges that Nate has thrown down around just social media marketing in isolation and around um, suites versus point solutions, if you do blend social with non-social data, if you do get your systems plugging and playing nicely, where can you get to? What does the higher ground look like? So firstly, uh, this is not the clothing company that this guy represents. I just happened to like this jacket, nearly bought it, but managed to avoid it. Um, and it's an example of a, of a, of a fashion uh, retailer here in the US, which wanted to understand which brands and its existing uh, customers were talking about publicly, and then use that insight to sell more to those customers by being smarter. So what these guys did was they acquired social media mentions for the key brands that they stock. So each of the main brands that they hold, they bought the social media mentions in aggregate over a given period. They then worked with a third-party vendor 
to match the social identities of the people talking about these brands with their own CRM database using email address as the, as the connector, as the unique identifier. So already we're bringing in third-party databases, we're bringing in their own CRM and email marketing databases. And then they did the club, clever stuff. Using one-to-one -one personalization at scale, they promoted very targeted offers to the subset of people who were their existing customers who were talking on social about very specific brands, either with intent to purchase or general brand advocacy and love or just chitter chatter with friends. They did this through email marketing and e-commerce merchandising. So again, bringing more pieces of the marketing technology landscape into play. And this was delivering ROI that, according to the friend of mine who works at this company, made the leadership's jaws drop. It led to very high ROI campaigns that were able to be replicated and developed further. So I hope you see how this just one quick small example brings to life this, this five-step checklist. Another example we actually touched on in the last webinar, um, but it's one of my favorites. Again, this car company isn't actually the car featured. I just chose an Escalade because as someone who's not native to the US, I love the fact that Tony Soprano drives an Escalade. So here, what the car company wanted to do was increase sales and put a real customer value to answer that thing that Nate was talking about, about the credibility gap, a real customer value on social interactions and investment that the rest of the business could really believe in and support as a business case. So these guys are using Brandwatch social intelligence to locate mentions of their car model names with intent to purchase language like test drive. And using rules and categories and tags, they're automatically filtering those conversations. They've then again matched those social handles with their own CRM details of known customers so that they can understand and start to experiment with this idea of social CRM at scale. And bearing in mind this is a global car brand, so this is not kind of a small stuff. They've seen an increase in car sales from test drives by driving these people and promoting and actively signposting them to local dealerships. They've seen a very, very clear link from social through to the true lifetime value of the customer, so they've seen the car purchase. They've seen um, and been able to tie back to some extent the customer lifetime value, its interaction with, with the service history. And this is giving them deep and personalized insights into product and customer experience feedback. So this is a really, really exciting example for me. So from a closing the gap checklist point of view, this is working across multiple departments and teams in a global car brand, looking at insights and marketing and product and CRM and blending social intelligence, not just on its own, but with CRM and location and sales data. So really this is about imagining what you can do. It's about figuring out, taking a step back and thinking, who in the organization can we work with? And from a data point of view, what are we already sitting on that if worked with the social intelligence can actually give us much smarter and better answers, a much clearer path to the real answers and conclusions and outcomes that matter to the business. So lastly, a quick recap. Find the internal clients, find the other data sources, use methods of distribution like APIs and partner integrations to integrate enterprise social intelligence into your broader MarTech stack, and, and then run these practical proofs of concept. That's one thing that's really consistent with our clients is small, quick proofs of concept that demonstrate real return on investment. To show